All right, welcome back. U.S. versus Lopez. All right, so our context is the same as in McCulloch. We're looking at national and state relations again. All right, so the facts of this case, this is all about a federal law called the Gun-Free School Zones Act of 1990, and Congress passed this law, and then a student in Texas brought an unloaded gun to school, and he was charged with that federal crime. So the question is, because obviously you're not allowed to bring a gun to school, the question is, was the Gun-Free School Zones Act unconstitutional? because it exceeded the power of Congress to legislate under the Commerce Clause, meaning that Congress, their defense of why they're allowed to make this law was because it affected interstate commerce. So is that an ex did they exceed their power using the Commerce Clause? The Supreme Court ruled against Congress. They said that the law is unconstitutional because possession of a gun in a school zone does not quote, substantially affect, end quote, any sort of interstate commerce. So they rule against this. Now, what's really notable here is this is the first modern limit of Congress's Commerce Clause powers. From 1937 to 1995, the Supreme Court had essentially ruled in favor of Congress and in favor of laws every single time that Congress used the Commerce Clause as the basis of their law. And so this kind of not kind of, but this is a major shift in the way that the Supreme Court is interpreting Congress's commerce powers. So what led to this shift? What constitutional principle could they point to to support the majority decision? By the way, this is a five to four decision. This is a very, very split court, very divisive case, um, and we're going to look at both majority and dissenting opinions in just a moment. But the majority opinion it was based on the 10th Amendment. They argued that the 10th Amendment creates a federal system that protects state power. And they went so far as to say that the Commerce Clause does not grant Congress endless power. And you're going to see from the quotes that they felt like if they allowed Congress to make this law under the Commerce Clause, that it would essentially allow Congress to do anything they wanted. So this is one of your first cases in modern times that kind of reaffirmed that the 10th Amendment exists and matters. So they use the 10th Amendment to go against or to limit the commerce powers of Congress. All right, so we're going to look at a few quotes from the majority opinion first. And what they argue here is that possessing a gun in a school zone is in no sense an economic activity and does not substantially affect any sort of interstate commerce. So again, you see those words there, substantially affect. Um, hopefully we recall from previous videos on the Commerce Clause in general, the idea was that from 1937 onwards, from the Wickard case, we had where the Supreme Court basically said anything that affects, at first they said substantially affects, then they made it just affects, then they even went so far as to just say that relates to uh, any sort of inter interstate commerce was something that Congress could do. This is scaling that back, and it says, well, actually, it's not scaling it back. It still is using the substantially effect phrase. It's just arguing that this particular thing, guns in school, that that does not substantially affect interstate commerce. All right, so this is a little bit of a longer quote. I kind of apologize for that, but again, uh, a lot of the AP tests, you're going to be reading from these opinions, and so we have to get comfortable with it. I bolded the most important phrases within here, but essentially what this quote, so I'd encourage you, pause the video, read the whole thing for yourself, but he's saying here um, that if they upheld this law, that it's difficult to perceive any limitation on federal power. Essentially that if you say that bringing a gun to school is interstate commerce, that they're arguing it would mean that basically anything is interstate commerce, therefore there wouldn't be any limitation on federal power. And so the final sentence, he says, if we were to accept the government's arguments, we are hard pressed to posit any activity by an individual that Congress is without power to regulate. So they felt that this was a gross overstep of congressional power using the Commerce Clause and that it would essentially grant to Congress unlimited power, which they were not willing to do. And that's actually what they're going to say again here. This is, again, the same idea. Um, they say, essentially, they're saying how far they would have to stretch the Commerce Clause in order to find that this was interstate commerce. 
and that there will never that there never will be a distinction between what is truly national and what is truly local. Again, notice that they are describing federalism here. What is truly national, what is truly local, and they're not willing to do that, so there needs to be a distinction. So again, this is that Tenth Amendment. Um, there needs to be a distinction between what's national, what's delegated to the national government, versus what is reserved to the states. So this is going to definitely shift um, policy in a more uh, limited direction for the federal government and reassert states' rights. Now, what about the dissenting opinion? Their basic argument is that for the last 60 years, the Supreme Court has ruled exactly this kind of thing constitutional, and that this is no different than a whole bunch of other things that they made that they've ruled constitutional in the past and allowed Congress to do. So what this one argues that will be kind of the next two quotes I have. This one is saying, could Congress rationally have found that violent crime in school zones through its effect on quality of education significantly or substantially affects interstate commerce? The answer to this question must be yes. So in other words, this is taking the view that um, violence in schools, guns in schools, negatively affects a person's education, and that will then in the future negatively affect uh, their job prospects, their ability to engage in interstate commerce. Um, and so they're saying, yes, this law is constitutional. It clearly does affect uh, interstate commerce. Now, they're going to point out some of the problems here. And the main problem in this section that they're looking at is the uncertainty. It says that this threatens legal uncertainty in an area of law that until this case seemed reasonably well settled. Like I said, for the last 60 years, the Supreme Court would have said yes to this exact kind of case. And so there are so many laws that have been made that are on the books already and that Congress could currently be thinking of making that now are going to be called into question. So the second paragraph there, it says, um, however they resolve these things, the legal uncertainty now created will restrict Congress's ability to enact criminal laws. So again, pointing out the limitation on congressional power, from the dissent, this is a negative thing. From the majority opinion, this is a positive development. All right, don't forget, subscribe, hit that like button for me. This has been a LaMoney production.